Hello, welcome everyone. Um, this is Alexa, and he will be talking about rootless containers with RunC. Could you please give him a warm welcome? Hang on, setting my alarm. Okay, right. Hello, everyone. So, as she said, my name is Alexa. Um, so, rootless containers with RunC. But first, who am I? So I'm Alexa, also known as Cypher. Um, I'm a software engineer on the containers team at SUSE. Uh, we are hiring, by the way, uh, but I promise it's the last time I'll mention it. Um, and so we provide enterprise support for containers on our operating system. And I, we do a lot of upstream work as part of that. Uh, I'm also an undergraduate student at the University of Sydney. Uh, I'm studying physics and computer science, which is a very fun mix. Um, I've been a Run C maintainer for uh, almost a year now. And I'll talk more about Run C and the Open Container Initiative in a minute. Um, but I've been a, a long-term contributor to both the OCI and to Docker uh, for quite a long time, for I think three years now, four years. And I'm a huge proponent of free software. So um, just as a bit of background for people who don't know, uh, the Open Container Initiative is a standards body that was created in 2015. Yes, that's what I got on the slide. Uh, 2015 to standardize uh, container formats and runtimes. Uh, it was originally, basically what happened is that Docker was getting really big, and then you also had Rocket and other implementations, and then someone said, oh, wait a second, maybe we should standardize things. So uh, Docker donated a bunch of its, um, I guess, IP is what you could say, uh, to a foundation which was called the Open Container Initiative, which is now part of the Linux Foundation. So there are two main components. You have the runtime configuration, and you have the image format. Um, and run C is the de facto implementation of the runtime specification for Linux. Uh, so you can run it as, so on Linux, you can suck containers and run them with run C. Um, it just needs a root file system and a configuration file, and the configuration file is defined by the, um, by the specification. And so uh, actually, the really, well, the thing that probably uh, you might not know is that uh, run C is the runtime that Docker uses. So when you start a Docker container, you're actually starting a run C container. It's just that Docker adds like uh, images on top of it. Um, but yeah, so it's actually all run C. So um, before I get into rootless containers and what they are and how they work and all the lovely problems involved with them, uh, let's start with a hypothetical. So let's imagine you're a researcher at a unnamed Australian university uh, who has, you've just written some Python 3 code that does some analysis of something. And you want to run it on your university cluster, which obviously runs Python 2 because they're still stuck in the 90s. So you need to figure out some way like, oh, okay, what do I do? Well, this researcher has heard of Docker, so like, okay, clearly I'll just use a container and I'll just package Python 3 and it'll just work, right? But the administrator um, doesn't want to install Docker. And to be fair, they have a point, right? If you want to install Docker, uh, the big problem with Docker is that it's a daemon that runs as root. And this is the problem with basically most runtimes, is that uh, they run as root, and you, if you want to create a container, there's like no real way of limiting that access for an unprivileged user. So if you're Docker, if you, if you have Docker in your system, and you allow someone to create containers with Docker, you also allow them to get root on your machine, which is not very nice. And especially, uh, the university does not think kindly of those sorts of things. Uh, and the same applies for um, Rocket, which uses systemd, but it still requires privileges. The same thing applies for uh, LXC, which has LXD, and so on and so on. So what do you do? Well, uh, the next thing a person thinks to do is obviously compile everything from scratch. Uh, if you've ever tried to compile NumPy and SciPy from scratch, uh, including like, LA pack and blaz, it's not fun. So that's not gonna work. So what should we do, right? Like what is the solution to this problem? And sort of the big, the key question is the problem here is not the, uh, can we make compiling easier? The big problem is, is why can't we use containers as an unprivileged user? Why is that not possible? And what if we could do that? What if it was possible to do that? So. Um, yeah, so before we go on, uh, this is actually not hypothetical. This was me uh, in 2016. I was doing some research project, and yeah, it was not fun. And I wasn't kidding when I said NumPy and SciPy are a huge pain. But it's not just me. Like, I've talked to a lot of other researchers, people in my faculty, um, people, I've talked to people at CERN about release containers, and they also have this exact same problem. Um, uh, the problem is obviously a bit more <laughs> nuanced if you work for CERN, but the, it's the same idea. It's like, oh, I want to run this thing, and I don't want the administrator to have to like, mess around with it because that's just a huge overhead, and I have to get them to like, agree to like 15 different forms, and yada, yada, yada. So yeah, so it's, it's, a, it's a real issue, and it's something that needs to be fixed. Um, so. How do we do that? 
So very, very quick ultra, ultra short primer on how containers work. Uh, on Linux, there is a Linux kernel primitive called namespaces. And basically, they allow you to isolate the view, uh, uh, like a process's view of parts of the system. So for instance, you can make a process think that it's the only process on the system, so you can isolate it from all the other processes. You can isolate its view of mounts, so it thinks that like its mount points are something else, which the its parent process isn't. Um, you can mess around with users, you can mess around with a bunch of other things. Um, and sort of the main thing that most people care about when they think about containers is this property, is that, oh, I can create a process that thinks it's in a different context. It's kind of like a VM, but it's not. Um, the other thing that people talk about is C groups. Um, C groups are a resource control mechanism for Linux. Uh, well, actually, they're a bit more than that now, but they originally were a resource control mechanism for Linux. And if you're a user, you don't really care. If you're an admin, you care, but if you're a user and you just want to say, oh, okay, and let me just start a container and I just want to run some stuff, you don't really care. And that's good because uh, they don't work, but we'll get back, back to that in a minute. Um, and obviously, as I mentioned there, it's, it is actually mostly duct tape. There is a lot of uh, messy stuff that goes on because a lot of these interfaces are either new or because of the way they're written, it's very, very annoying to use them. Um, I say that from experience. But one of the coolest, or one of the most interesting namespaces, for us at least, is the user namespace. So if you've not heard of it, a user namespace is a namespace that allows you to isolate the view of users. And so essentially you can pretend that an unprivileged user is actually root. So what does that specifically mean? Uh, so in a user namespace, uh, capabilities, which is um, a thing on Linux where basically, it's a, a thing with permission checks, but basically a capability of a process and its UIDs and GIDs are all scoped based on the user namespace. And it's all done through mappings. So like you have this block of UIDs and GIDs in your host and you want to create a mapping in the, uh, in the container. And so essentially you say, okay, UID zero in the container is actually UID 10,000 in the host, um, and stuff like that. And so the permission checks, and the other thing is, is that a namespace, when you create a namespace, it knows what, it's, what the user namespace it was created under was. So what happens is that you end up with permission checks on a, on a, inside a particular context, like if I want to create a network device or something, the permission checks, it checks the user namespace of the network namespace that I'm in, and it, there's a bunch of other, it's quite complicated, but the idea is, is that the permission checks are all scoped to the user namespace you're in, and then everything is sort of flows from there. Oh, and the other thing is that you get EPERM on any operation that is on an unmapped UID or GID, because obviously you can have these mappings, but these mappings are fixed in length. So you can have UIDs that aren't mapped, and in that case, you just can't do anything with them, uh, even if you have capabilities and other things. And obviously that's for security reasons. So since Linux 3.8, unprivileged users are able to create a user namespace. And it's been mostly safe since 3.19. It took a little while, but um, there are, <laughs> It turns out it's complicated to make it possible for people to get privileges uh, without causing endless security bugs, but it's mostly working now, so it's all good. Um, and ultimately, if, if you're just a user, you don't really care that much about security, right? Like, I mean, you're not gonna break anything, right? Um, but anyway, so uh, essentially, this means that if you can create a new user namespace, you can now create all these other namespaces underneath it, and now you have privileges that you wouldn't normally have. Um, and so you can cr now create a fully namespaced environment without any privileges, which is great if, if you're a container runtime, but also if you want to use this stuff. Um, and obviously, because it's all created from an unprivileged perspective, certain operations are more restricted uh, naturally. Like, for example, you can't just create uh, your hard disk uh, node and just read from it. That would be dumb. Um, and the other thing to note is that uh, only your user and group are mapped. So because of this mapping stuff, um, it's just simply not secure for you to be able to map any other user into an unprivileged user namespace. So you can only map yourself, which is something we'll get back to in a minute because that turns out breaks a lot of things. Um, so how do we go about implementing it? Well, the solution is get someone like me to implement it for you uh, rather than you doing it, um, so, which I've already done, so yay. Um, or you could do it manually. You know, I mean, it's, it's you know, fairly short. Uh, actually, it's not that short. It's, I think, the full list is like, 50 lines long, but basically, you can do it. Uh, it's a bit long, but you can do it. And um, yeah, yay, mounting. So what works? So if you've not used Run C before, um, uh, Run C is like a subcommand-based process, kind of like it. So the idea is, is that you can do Run C run thing, and you can do Run C exec, and yada, yada. So currently, as an unprivileged user, um, uh, you can run a container, you can create a container, you can start a container, you can exec into an existing container, 
you can kill a container, you can delete a container, yada, 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 and you can start attach containers and stuff like that. Um, and the really cool thing, and this is different from, uh, so I gave a talk on this uh, last year, and uh, finally it's actually all now tested. So now uh, you, we actually have a full test suite for Run-C, and now all of this stuff is tested as, a, as an unprivileged user, which is really great, because it means that uh, when stuff breaks, as it often does, uh, we, we can keep track of it. And um, yeah, th there's a pull request there, um, which has the current state, so this isn't merged in Run-C yet, this is still a patch set, but it's going to be merged soon. I mean. I'm a maintainer, so I would hope it will be soon. Um, but yeah, so some stuff is broken. Um, in particular, there's two classes of things that break. There is checkpoint and restore, and there is C groups, which again, as I said, we'll get back to later because it's kind of a long rant. Um, so the big thing is that checkpoint and restore is, um, so Run-C has support for checkpoint and restoring a process. And so you can checkpoint a process, oh sorry, you can checkpoint a container and you can restore a container. So I can say, okay, on this system I'll checkpoint the container, save a file to disk, I then take this file, put it somewhere else and I can restore it, um, or even on different systems as well, which are pretty cool. But the problem is that this currently is not, so we use another tool to do this um, and that tool currently does not support unprivileged process it, like you can't as an unprivileged user do it. So f for the moment we've just, I've just disabled it because it probably doesn't work. Um, so the other thing is C groups. So unfortunately, as I said, oh, you don't really care if you're, an, if you're a user about C groups. Well, unfortunately, if you want to pause and resume a container, so for example, you pause the container um, and then you can resume it later, uh, like on the same system, uh, we use a, there's a C group controller called the freezer C group, which allows you to say this set of processes stop right now and then I can restart it later. Uh, unfortunately, uh, because C groups, which we'll get back to in a minute, because of that, you can't use it. Uh, events doesn't really matter because since we don't have C groups, events doesn't really mean anything. And run CPS, which gives you a list of processes, the host PIDs, but oh, inside the container, and that doesn't work, again, because of C groups, because C groups allow you to group processes together and um, it's used a lot and it's very useful, unfortunately, because we can't use C groups, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't work. So, I've talked about runtime for now, so quick diversion about images. So, uh, as I mentioned before, there's two specifications. So the runtime is actually only half the story. The other half of the story is images. And so images are great, you know, I mean, where are you gonna get yourself from? Um, so, r recently, and luckily, this is actually already basically been solved, uh, there have been two tools that have been created to make this exceptionally easy. There's one tool called Scopio, which is a, a, project, a part of Project Atomic, which is a thing that Red Hat is working on. Um, and it allows you to download and convert images from a registry and convert them to a different image format. So in particular, you can take a Docker image from the registry, pull it, and then you can just uh, splat it out and it'll be an OCI image, for example. And I, I've been working on getting it to work properly with OCI images, but it works now, mostly. Um, and the other tool is Emochi, which is a tool that I wrote, um, which allows you to take an OCI image, and unpack it, meaning the OCI image has a root file system in it and it has some configuration. It allows you to extract that and put it into a, uh, into a directory so you can use it as like a container. Uh, it also has other cool stuff which we're not gonna, which I'm gonna show, but you can repack, you can create diff layers, you can modify the configuration, you can do other cool stuff. Um, but essentially, it, for now, it's a really cool way of unpacking. And in particular, I implemented un uh, unprivileged unpacking support, which is what you'll see in a minute. So, now you can use images as an unprivileged user as well, which is pretty cool. Uh, unfortunately, you don't get any of the cool file system features. So, for example, if you use Docker, you'll find that the root file system that your containers run in is like under ButterFS or something, and it uses ButterFS snapshots to create the whole union file system thing. Uh, as it turns out, um, get, allowing an unprivileged user to do file system operations like that, not very safe, so uh, you can't do that. But, I mean, again, you don't really care because a directory is good enough for just running some code. So, live demo, here we go. Here we go, all right, so, right. So, uh, first, I'm going to do the obviously uh, brave thing of downloading something from the internet. Uh, actually, no, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I've already downloaded it, so that's great. So, Scopio allows you to copy an image. Uh, so, uh, so, one of the things I mentioned is obviously we wanna run Python 3 code, and so, um, I've already done the, the, the lovely steps of actually building the Docker, the Docker image and doing everything else, um, but the general idea is, is you, can, um, you, know, you can pull it from somewhere and I've already pushed it. So I'm going to convert this to an OCI image called image and I'll call it latest. 
Uh, and so if I ran this, it would download it from the internet, but because of conference Wi-Fi, I am not gonna do that because that would be dumb. So I'm going to pull it from the local Docker daemon. So this is now just gonna copy this image from my local Docker daemon that's running on this laptop, and it will convert it to an OCI image in my local directory, which then Umochi can handle. Uh, you could go about this by like using Docker extract or whatever, but the thing is is that the important thing to note is that I, this does not require any privileges. So I could copy, I could download a Docker image using Scopio, and Scopio doesn't require any privileges to download anything because you know it's just connected to the internet and just downloading files. Um, but if you tried to use like Docker export or something, it wouldn't work because you don't have privileges on the system to do that. Um, so yeah, uh, fun stuff, okay. So I now have this thing called image, which contains lovely blobs and stuff. So I can now do Omochi, uh, unpack, rootless, and so the rootless is, I implemented rootless support, which is great because as it turns out, images are not actually as simple as you might think. Um, and so image, image, latest, and make a root file, let's make a bundle. Okay, and so now this will extract the so it understands, when I say rootless, it understands that it wants to map to my current user, um, which I'll show you in a minute, but essentially it generates all the stuff that's necessary and it, and it extracts it and it, 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 like for example, it ignores uh, um, uh, X adders that are like uh, related to security because obviously you can't set them as an unprivileged user. Okay, and so uh, just to show you, I'm currently unprivileged, I mean, I am in the Docker group, but I'm not gonna use Docker, so you can ignore that. But yeah, I'm an unprivileged user, I have no capabilities. So, here we go, run C, root, uh, run, dash B, what did I call it, bundle? Okay, CTR. Okay, I'm now inside a container. So, ah, uh, control L doesn't work. Never mind, okay, anyway. I am in a container now. This is in a container rootfs. If I wanted to, I could blast away this file system, you know, do the, all the, the lovely examples of like, oh look, I can break everything. Um, but rather than doing that, I'm gonna give you a short example of me running the actual analysis code from my project. Uh, so let's see how that goes. So I mean, I, was, I couldn't think of a nice demo, so I was like, okay, I'll just like run the analysis code. So what this does is it'll download two files from the internet and uh, conference Wi-Fi, please be nice. But uh, there, there's a reason I'm doing this, is this is to show you that you can actually get internet access, um, which sounds like a very trivial thing, but we'll get back to that in a minute. So I'm downloading two files from the internet, uh, and now it's going to do an analysis, and while it's doing that, I am going to, I'm gonna show you that exec works. Okay, I forgot to set this up earlier, so source talks, 2017, LCA, Rootless demo. Okay, and so I can now do run C root temp run C exec CTR sh. Okay, and so now you can join an existing container also as an unprivileged user, um, which is kind of cool. Um, again, it, it's much harder than it looks, uh, but yeah, so I can I can see the other processes and stuff like that. So Python three is running and all the other fun stuff. So yep, um, yeah, and so and oh yeah, so one thing to notice is that. Um, I am root, uh, I am root. Uh, it's obviously I'm not actually root. And if you if you looked outside, um, you can do the whole thing of, let's do this quickly. Okay, so as you can see, it's a bit complicated, but you can see that outside the container, my process is actually running as myself, as, as me, but inside it thinks it's root, okay. And uh, here is a lovely plot that is done with GNU plot and it's just a dumb example, but basically this is some star data that I just analyzed on the fly, which I'm actually surprised that worked. Okay, um, that's, I think it's everything? Yeah, it's everything, okay, cool. All right, the demigods did have mercy. All right, so what doesn't work? And this is sort of the fun part of the talk. So what is broken? Well, as it turns out, um, there are quite a few janky interfaces that start showing up when you start allowing people to like map users and stuff. So one in particular is that um, certain syscalls will always fail inside a container, inside a rootless container, because of either privilege reasons or because it's like not safe to allow a user to do that. So for example, um, set UID, set GID will fail because you can't change to an unmapped user. CHN will fail, again, for the same reason. Set groups will always fail because that's a that's a security thing the kernel did. MK not will fail because otherwise you could like open a hard disk and read from it, which is bad. 
And then there's other stuff like, for example, get groups gives you weird results. There's a, other things. But basically, the point is that certain syscalls act weirdly under rootless containers, which is fine. However, it turns out that certain programs make assumptions about uh, these sorts of syscalls, in particular, package managers. So, um, it, as it turns out, and I found this out the hard way, apt likes to test whether it's in a sandbox before doing anything. So if you have apt, if you have Ubuntu, and you want to run Ubuntu in a rootless container, you use apt, and you're like, oh, okay, apt get, inst apt get install. And what will happen is that apt will be like, oh, okay, let me try changing myself to another user. And then when that fails, it then goes, have I changed myself to that other user? And that also says, no, you haven't. And then it's like, oh, okay, bye-bye, good luck, have fun. Um, and it just doesn't do anything. So. There's two solutions. One solution is to fix every single program that exists. Uh, and I mean, maybe you can do that, but not me, because um, there's only one of me. So the solution I came up with is I'll just write a tool that emul emulates the privilege model um, of, of, uh, of Linux uh, using ptrace. So it's, in essence, it's just a, a simple tool. Well, simple. It's a, it's a tool <laughs> that uh, takes a process, and it will essentially overwrite the syscall return values to make it so it appears as though uh, set UID works, like so you, it looks as though I've changed the user. Um, it's, it's really hacky, but it does sort of work. I mean, apt still eludes me because it like forks in weird ways and does weird things, but it mostly works and it's sort of a cool demo of things. I don't have it installed, unfortunately, so um, you can sort of, I mean, you can imagine what it does, right? It's like, oh, look, it works. But uh, there is a link you can go down to the source code and put, run it on your machine. Uh, I don't have a cool uh, pipe to SH script, but I probably should add one. Okay, so uh, what about networking? And I sort of made a big deal about, oh, look, I have the internet. So as it turns out, um, network namespaces are fun. And when I say they're fun, I mean they're not very fun. So as it turns out, as an unprivileged user, when you create a network namespace, it's when you create a new network namespace just in general, uh, the namespace is empty. It only has a loopback interface, and that looping, loopback interface is local to that namespace, meaning that you can't like do anything with it, right? Like it's like okay, great, I can like listen to myself and do nothing. Um, but if you want to actually connect to the internet, you need to create a bridge, and that's done through these things called VF pairs. And the essence is is that I create a VF interface in one namespace, and I create one in the other namespace, and then the two communicate with each other, and then it all works. Unfortunately, to create VF pairs, you need to have a certain capability, Captain that admin, in both namespaces. So you need to have it in both the rootless container namespace, which you have because you created it, but you don't have it in the host. So you can't really use network namespaces properly. Um, and so the solution to this problem is you just don't set up the network namespace and you just use the host namespace, which is what I did. So um, if I actually, I'll show you that. Okay, so I'll show you, so if I go to bundle, uh, I just realized that, okay, so here is the, uh, here's the, the, what the OCI specification JSON looks like. It's not pretty, but it works. Um, in essence, uh, yeah, so you give it the list of namespaces you need. Oh, okay, obviously my screen is too small. Okay, so you give it the list of the things you need, and you'll notice that there's no network uh, thing set up. And, and if you don't set a network namespace, you don't create one, you just inherit the one from your parent, and the one from your parent has network access, so it all works out. Um, unfortunately, you can't use things like IP tables. Um, you can't, yes, yeah, so you can't use things like IP tables, uh, and you can't do cool stuff with like VF things to like mess around and like create like networks of rootless containers. Um, but you do get network access at the very least. Um, you could create a rootless container and then create like sub containers and then link the sub containers, um, which would be fun. Unfortunately, they can't connect to the internet, so it's sort of like they communicate with each other, but not really doing much. Um, so there is some movement within the kernel to fix this problem, um, at least from what I've heard. It is, it, is a, it is a kernel problem in the sense that there's, just not, there's no like, way for this to be done at the moment. I'm hoping it will be possible to create a VF, like an unprivileged VF pair that, like, yeah, uh, that like, allows you to link something without giving you certain privileges, but you know, I'm not a network engineer, so I don't know how secure that would be. Um, there's also the possible idea of creating a user space daemon, um, and this is something I actually spent too much time thinking about actually doing, but I realized that it would be um, bad. So essentially what you would do is that you create a user space daemon that has a program inside the namespace and a pro like a, two processes that can communicate, and one is inside the rootless container and one is outside of it, and then you have like a tunnel tap interface inside the container, which then you, you communicate to. Then when it hits that process, it then like 
tells the other process what to do, and then you end up with like communication over TCP, but it's like rather than using VF, you implement it in user space. Um, if someone wants to do that, uh, don't tell me about it because that is a horrible idea, but it will be possible to do. Um, I'm hoping that it just gets fixed in the kernel and we don't have to worry about it. Um, so yeah, so what about C groups? So C groups, as I said, are a resource control mechanism. Um, although they do more than that now. C groups is essentially, you can take a process, stick it in a C group, and unless it has certain privileges, it can't, it will always be in that C group. And the C group knows what processes are inside it. All the children of a process stay inside the C group, and um, it's all hierarchical and lovely and uh, great. Uh, so the C groups interface, because it's hierarchical, um, as a decision that was made in the past was the, to make it a virtual file system. So there is a file system at slash, slash sys slash fs slash C group, which exists and you can look at it and it will show you the entire tree of all the processes inside different C groups and it's great um, and it's all owned by root and it's all uh, not world readable, uh, sorry, not world writable, which means that it, as an unprivileged user, there's not much you can like do with it, especially because root is not mapped inside an unprivileged container because the only process that is mapped is me, so the only user ID that's mapped is me and I'm not root on the host, so because I'm mapped, I can't, there's like I can't even, in most cases, you can't even read some of the files. So that's a problem. Um, and it's a problem that doesn't really make much sense because if you think about it, so C group V1 is a bit of an iffy thing, but C group V2 is entirely hierarchical. So in other words, if you're inside, if you're inside a particular C group, there is, you are essentially guaranteed that, if, that you cannot escape the, the resource constraints of any of your parents. And this is quite an important thing, obviously, for resource control, but it also means that implicitly, if you can't go up in the tree, if you don't have privileges to go up in the tree, then creating things lower in the tree won't do anything. Like, you can, you can further limit yourself, but you can't unlimit yourself. So, in principle, it's like, oh, but so that means we could have what I call unprivileged subtree management, but basically it's like, I could create a sub-C group and then mess with it. Um, so why don't we have it? It's because no one implemented it. So I went and tried to implement it, uh, and it didn't go well. So the maintainer, who's, uh, whose, na uh, whose name is Tejan, he, uh, he's, he seems to have some fundamental issues with the idea. Um, in particular, there are concerns about the fact that it pokes holes in the file system, the, the way the file system looks, and also because um, my code is bad, but also because um, it, has the, it has issues with like, um, so systemd is great and all, but the thing is is that um, systemd likes to control the entire C group uh, tree. Uh, and in particular, it uses C groups to, to round up its processes, like to keep track of what service has what in it. Um, so the problem is is if you can now create sub C groups, you can confuse systemd, but also systemd, if it's in the middle of an operation to mess around processes, I uh, sorry, I mean manage processes, um, it will, uh, it will break because like you've changed something and then it, it like starts reverting things. It's it, it's a legitimate problem and it is a fair criticism. Um, and I was trying to come up with like a way to make it so it's like optional and like you can like lock out systemd from doing things. But I guarantee that no one would like that. So yeah. So well, okay, yeah, okay. Lots of people would like it if I could lock out systemd entirely, but I am afraid I don't have that power. Um, so. Yeah, so it's a problem and unfortunately at the moment the only real solution is to either not use C groups or to ask someone else to manage the C groups for you, which is what LXC does. So LXC has some similar ideas for rootless containers um, and what they do is that they have a process that is privileged that then manages C groups for you, um, which again is now sidestepping the issue of like, oh okay, I don't have to ask them to install Docker, I just have to install the, ask them to install this random binary which will start modifying system files. I'm sure that'll go well. So, what other stuff is broken? Um, yeah, so I actually just found out yesterday that uh, we recently had a CV that was fixed in RunC, and it turns out that it broke rootless containers quite badly. Uh, and it turns out it was actually a kernel bug, so I went and fixed that. But my point being that there are still a lot of janky interfaces with containers, it just with containers in general, but there's also janky interfaces with how um, everything all works together with unprivileged users, which is, you know, something that needs to be worked on, something that needs to be fixed. So. Um, so yeah, so run CPS, uh, which is a tool that I mentioned earlier, it uses C groups, uh, and unfortunately, this is like the one thing left that I can potentially fix without having to go to the kernel to fix it, and that is uh, that run CPS is a, t actually I can show you. So run CPS is a tool that allows you to do stuff like this. So uh, I will now run this as root, so let me do run dash base image, I mean bundle, bundle CTR, okay. 
Okay, and so now I can go and do sudo run c list, and it'll show me. So I have this container running called CTR, and I can do sudo run c ps CTR, and it'll list to me the process, and it's PIDs, but it's PIDs are not the PIDs inside the container. It's not the same as me running PS here, right? Because it, the process thinks, oh, I am PID one, right? It's actually the process in the in the host, um, and this is. Well, I mean, some people say it's useful. I have, oops, uh, you know, spoilers. Um, so some people say it's useful, but unfortunately, uh, it's a bit broken at the moment because it uses C groups. Um, it, there is a way to reimplement it, um, but I don't want to do it because it turns out that. Um, I don't know how many of you have played with Unix sockets before, but it turns out there's a lot of really fun stuff you can do with Unix sockets. And in particular, you can send file descriptors, but you can also send process IDs over Unix sockets. And magically, it all like converts, and it's yeah, it's fun. I'm not going to implement that. Well, I, I started implementing it, and then I realized that it would be a huge pain. Um, but the big thing is, is that I would really like it if people would actually go and test. So again, here's the pull request. Or oh, you can just like search rootless containers on the issue tracker. Um, and Tell me what you find. It probably will be slightly broken, um, but it works now as far as I'm aware. Uh, it works for me, so you know it's all good. Uh, ship it. Anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <sighs> okay. As, so, as someone who uh, works on distribution, it actually kills me to say that out loud. Anyway, so um, just for researchers. So I mentioned researchers quite a bit, and that's because my use case in particular was about researchers, because it was a problem that I had, but there are many other use cases. So for example, what if you could use container features in a desktop application? What if you could run a container that has a desktop application in it? But more interestingly, what if you could have a desktop application that runs containers inside it? And actually, Chrome is kind of doing this with all their sandboxing stuff. And actually, the biggest thing is that the C group stuff I was working on would actually be useful for Chrome. So if some, someone from Chrome could convince Tjun to add the feature, that would be great. Um, but yeah, so anyway, the point is, is that there is actually a tool called Bubble Wrap which allows you to, um, it, if you've heard of XDG apps, it's a similar idea. You have a desktop application packaged inside a container, um, and it can actually run as an unprivileged user, but unfortunately, uh, it's not OCI compliant and stuff like that, so it's kind of cool to have it in run C, but anyway. The, the point is, is that there are cooler ideas you can have. You could actually have a really crazy idea about um, using Kubernetes as an unprivileged user, which uh, requires fixing the whole networking thing, but in theory, in theory, um, I would hope that it would work. I haven't actually tried to make it work because it would, it, it would be a huge pain. But in principle, you could try to make it so that you could run Kubernetes as a completely unprivileged user, including the whole manager system and everything else. Because if you can make the networking work, in other words, if you can just come up with a way to make all the networking hook together, you could, again, in theory, uh, make it so that all the containers can communicate, but also that they all like run under different supervisors. Because once you have the runtime working, it's just a matter of making sure the other stuff works. And I mean, you know, you can have your own ideas, or you know, you could profit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the theme of the conference is the future of open source or the future of free software. Um, so in my mind, the future of the future is to refine and extend existing ideas. Um, and so for containers, this is allowing everyone to use them. Um, uh, so not just root and whatever else, but also allowing everyone to use them. Uh, one thing that I find is that in free software, we generally have a whole thing of like, oh, let's go chase the new thing. Well, actually, that's a thing in software in general. But it'd be really nice if we could like sit down and say, OK, let's actually make it so that this is actually a really cool feature that people might actually want to use in, in like really odd context. Let's make it so that it works for everything. Um, well, almost everything. But again, you know, features what you make it, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so quick acknowledgments. Uh, so, uh, quick thanks to Jessie Frizzell, who is um, someone who used to work at Docker. She works at Google now. Um, she started working. Yeah, uh, she started working on this first. She had a POC called BinCTR, and she hacked together hacked together by messing around with libcontainer. So. Thanks to her. Uh, Eric Biederman, who is a kernel dev who has been working quite tirelessly. There are other people, but he's the one who shows up in the commit logs. Um, he's been working tirelessly to get user interests working, in particular on privileged ones, so huge shout to him. And James Bottomley, who really helped me out with the kernel patches for the C group stuff. It wasn't merged, but it was still nice to have a conversation about it. Um, so yeah, so actually that is the end of my talk. So any questions? One thing I haven't tried, but I've come across recently I need to try, is a thing called uh, Singularity, which is particularly uh, designed for researchers to be able to uh, run stuff like Docker-like stuff, whereas they can't run Docker. Um, how's that fit in? Are you familiar with um, that particular solution?
No? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so, so I've actually I've heard of Singularity, and Singularity is, is kind of cool, um, although it's a little bit odd how they've done things, but Singularity is very cool. Actually, I'm not entirely sure if it actually uses container, all the container stuff that you could use, but anyway. Um, the real benefit, I feel, is that uh, this, the benefit of this as opposed to other things, like for example, Bubble Wrap already exists, as I mentioned, there's uh, LXC that already has something like this. Um, the benefit of doing it in an OCI compliant thing is that, well, th once the OCI hits 1.0, it'll be a proper standard, in which case you'll be able to say, I have this container and I can run it on full infrastructure or I can run it in a particular context like a rootless context. So the, the real benefit is the fact that it's using a standardized configuration format, it's using a standardized image format and things like that. So that's sort of the, that's, for me that's a big thing. Um, and also because it's kind of, kind of cool. But. <laughs> You're saying this is useful for research. Uh, I'm going to assume the answer is yes, but uh, how would you map in, say, Dev NVIDIA for CUDA cores? Uh, okay, uh, you wouldn't. Um, well, again, as an unprivileged user, there's not really much you can do. Uh, actually, I don't know how CUDA works because uh, I've never really had much experience with it, but um, uh, if you can access it as a regular user on a system, then in principle you should be able to do it in a rootless container. I mean, if it's a like a thing in dev that you have access to, then it's literally just a matter of doing, um, uh, it's just a matter of doing uh, like a bind mount or something like that. Um, although there might be some issues with, if it's like you have to be in the dialogue group and there isn't a dialogue group, I'd actually haven't played with that. Um, it's possible that it breaks, but in that case I would argue it's a kernel bug, not my problem, so, you know, you know complain to the local kernel maintainer. <laughs> I can also answer uh, generic OCI questions if you have any. So back in the olden days, we used to do these sorts of tricks using LD preload and ptrace, which you're doing some of your work with there. Um, and I guess one of the crazier examples was user mode Linux, which was you know a full Linux kernel that ptraced um, other processes to, to fake an entire kernel environment. Um, what do you feel the scope of this work is and where does that stop and something like user mode Linux, like you, you, you're slowly implementing, you know, I've noticed you're implementing the ptraced syscalls and if you keep going down that path, you end up re-implementing user mode Linux. Um, so like how does this collide with the old ways of doing things and where do you want to stop and start and things? Yeah, so, um, so one thing I should have probably clarified better is that um, so, if you're writing an application and you've written an application that allows you to run, uh, that it does something. For example, my Python code was just running pure Python, and there was no, uh, it wasn't, there was no ptrace involved. Um, my example of remain root is that certain applications, it is easier to hack around them rather than fix them. Um, and actually, I would argue that the fa the weirdness that I mentioned, I would argue, is actually a kernel bug. But the problem is, is that now that it's baked into the ABI, we can't fix it, or at least as far as I can tell, we can't fix it. Um, so. The thing is, is that the, the Ptrace stuff is just like an addition to like, oh, I want to install something in a rootless container on this server. Honestly, you shouldn't be doing that anyway because you can create the image on your local machine and then send it. Uh, th and obviously, the whole benefit of this is that because it's using container runtime stuff, it's much more efficient than Ptracing every single syscall and like messing with it. I mean, it is messing with it, but the kernel's messing with it rather than some user space process messing with it as well. So the question is about uh, motivation, because ultimately the kernel design as it stands is basically that uh, we have some global resources and we have some resources that you can use, or I should say, configure locally. And um, a lot of the stuff that has been built as global resources uh, will not lend itself easily to local configuration, and uh, network is just one example of that. Uh, but you have other examples, uh, for example, the scheduler itself. So. Um, Given that currently the model is that we ask something, the operating system, in this case the kernel, to do something on our behalf, why not just delegate it to a user space team like Docker? So I'm not sure I understand your question. So you're saying that because, hang on, so because we're asking the kernel to do stuff for us, why not? Like which which particular part are you referring to? If you, if you might remember me asking. So for example, when uh, 
when it comes to networking, um, you could ask Docker to configure that network for you. Um, the same way you would ask the kernel to configure that networking for you. Um, yes, it's not kernel space, but it's only configuration. So whether you care if it's user space or kernel space, why not treat that daemon as part of the operating system? Okay, yeah, so uh, the issue is is that, uh, okay, so the, yeah, so the problem is is that uh, Docker as it stands allows you to get root on a system, like, but just by being there, just by I have access to create a container or anything, I can get root on the system. Now, you could create a daemon that is running as root that will set up a network and do all this stuff for you. You could do that. Um, and in fact, that probably might be a nice way of doing it. The problem is, is that now you have to convince the admin, um, the one I mentioned earlier, you have to convince them to install that. And it's also a question of scope of vulnerability. Like if you now have some sort of RPC protocol where you say, oh, okay, this server, can you please set up this network for me? And then how does it make sure that, that is actually a safe thing to do? How does it make sure that suddenly you're not gonna start like, you know, uh, listening and everything, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the reason, some of the stuff that in kernel space that I'm referring to is that, it's stuff that the, um, the policy decisions that you can make in the kernel, in, in particular when it comes to namespaces, is just in general better, the interfaces are in, it, for, for user space to figure out what like capabilities you have are not as good as the ones in kernel, which ultimately means you could fix it and you can make it so that we can make privileged daemons that are better at doing these sorts of things. But on the other hand, um, coming up with systems for creating like networks inside processes, I feel like, would be useful outside of this work. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, ultimately it is like kind of a decision on whether or not they want the code, and if they don't want the code or they don't want to work on it, then we'll have to figure out something else, like, you know, the user mode daemon that I was referring to earlier, which would be very fun to work on. Well, thank you very much, Alexa, for coming to talk to us about this. Uh, just as a small token of appreciation from LCA, that's for you. All right. Thank you, everyone.